is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 198, covering the week of December 9th through December 13th, 2019. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute, like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute, and of course, subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. You can find all those social media accounts at our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. That's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, institute.org. While you're there, give us an email address and we'll give you a free ebook. And you'll get our Daily Dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. You can also get the Abbeville Institute on the go. Just download our free mobile app. Uh, and you can get that wherever you get your application, whether it's uh, Apple, uh, your Apple Store or whether it's uh, Google Play. Wherever you get your apps, you can get the Abbeville Institute app. So you've got this podcast on the go. You've got all our lectures, website. Great way, again, free of charge. So you can get the Abbeville Institute on the go. Also, you can support the Abbeville Institute by going to abbevilleinstitute.org where it says support, that little tab there. Click on that and you'll see donor options. You can donate monthly, annually, or a one-time gift. And so everything we do is supported by you, whether you're a listener of the podcast or whether you read the articles or however you came across us, watch us on YouTube, however it is, you, we exist on your generous contributions alone. So if you want to explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition, we have the end of the year coming up. You're making your tax plans. You can donate to the Institute. It's donating to a charity. You click on that Amazon Smile button at the top of our webpage. Every time you shop at Amazon, you're donating to the Institute. Actually, Jeff Bezos is donating to the Institute, which is awesome. Um, so you've got lots of ways to support the Institute. You can go to, the again, click on that Support tab. Click on the Shop part of that. It takes you out to our online store where we have great embroidered Abbeville Institute apparel. So get your Abbeville Institute apparel. It's nice stuff. High quality stuff, where of course it is uh, embroidered, um, and so it will last a long time. It's not screen printed, which which matters. Um, there's lots of ways to support the institute. Lots of ways to get involved. Share our material on social media, like our podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Share it around as well. Do what you can to help us continue our mission to explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. We need you. More than you need us, I think, in many ways. But we need you. Um, so if, if you are someone who is inclined to open your wallet this time of the year, we would greatly appreciate it. All right, all that said, let's talk about the material. This is the next to last podcast for 2019. We will have one next week, and that will be it. I'll be taking a couple of weeks off. So, uh, And in fact, the Institute will be taking a couple of weeks off for the holiday season. Um, so uh, we'll talk about the year in review for the next podcast. I will get into that a little bit. Um, but I want to talk about the material this week in, in a general theme. And it, it's all in a general theme. And one of the things we try to do at the Institute, and I think is very important, is to portray a positive message of the South. You see, we could write something as reactionary. And, and it's fine to be reactionary. I mean, this is not something that's should be uh, you know shied away from when when the cultural Marxists attack the South, which it's it doesn't matter whether they're on the left or the right because essentially they're the same. I mean, with with friends like you know Glenn Beck and others who consistently attack the South or Alan Gelzo or Richard Brookheiser who are on the right, they might as well just be the cultural Marxists on the left or Dinesh D'Souza or others other people. So we could spend all of our time reacting to these things, and. We could fill up weeks and weeks and weeks of material for our website doing that. And there are people that take time to react to everything the left does and to say, well, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And yes, we, we do this and we do publish these things. But we also like to have this very positive view of what Southern culture and Southern, the Southern tradition and Southern society really is. You see, because if we don't do that, then all we're doing is us reacting to what the left is setting the agenda. They're setting the playing field. We want people to understand 
being Southern is a beautiful thing. Now, you know, every, every tradition has its, as I've said before on this show, the South is America, and every tradition has its thorns. Every rose has its thorns. Every tradition has its thorns. You don't hack down the entire rose bush, though, to get rid of the thorns. You tolerate the thorns because the roses are so beautiful. Right? Uh, I mean, you look at c- uh, crepe myrtles, beautiful flowers. It is a pain to cut those things back every year when you got to cut them back. But in the springtime, it's all worth it. And in the summer, when they bloom out again, it's all worth it. It's all worth it as they bloom out. Beautiful flowers, camellias make a big mess, but it's worth it when the flowers bloom in the winter to have those camellias and the fall and the winter. It's worth it to tolerate the mess. Now, it doesn't mean you don't try to, you don't sweep up the mess. You don't try to manage the mess. You don't try to make it to where the mess is, you just let it go. But you do understand that every tradition has things you may not like in it. And that's the same way with the Southern tradition. But the flower is worth it all. And so this particular week, we focused on the flower. On the flower of the Southern tradition. And that had to do with essentially three things. Music. uh, Well, four. Music, literature, great films that portray the South accurately. And um, sport. You see, the South is still the home of hunting in many ways. People, of course, hunt all over the United States, but you'll find more hunters in the South than you will anywhere else. And uh, hunting is always managed, and it's something that um, it's it's a serious sport for a lot of individuals. It's a nice pastime for a lot of it. It's a lot of way. It's a way that a lot of families in the South bond. Um. Uh, I was in the uh, the uh, dentist's office not long ago, and two guys there that knew each other, sort of, but I mean they were they were familiar with each other, and they talked for while I was waiting for 45 minutes about their hunting land. Now you're not going to find that in many other places around the United States. I mean you will find it in rural areas of the Midwest or the West or even in the North or the Mid Atlantic states, but. Um, this is something that you'll find more often than not. It's why you have so many hunting, you know, camping supply stores and hunting supply stores and gun shows and everything else in the South because the South loves its blood sports. And that's what these are. They're blood sports. It goes all the way back to Cavalier culture and Celtic culture. And I know people get upset when I say Celtic culture. It's a broad definition. I understand that, right? It's the, it's the, uh, when, when, when I say that, I'm talking about the general conceptualized term of the borderlands that came in and settled in the upcountry regions of the South. Some of these people were Irish. Some of these people were Scots-Irish. Some of these people were just Scotsmen. I mean, there's all kinds of different groups there. Some of these people were Welsh. Some of them were just borderland fringe of England. I understand they're not all Celtic by strict definition, but they are Celtic in terms of a large definition how we conceptualize these people. You also had Germans and other people out there, too. French, Spanish. Um, So we have this tradition of this southern sport. And look, personally, I'm not a hunter. But I understand it. I understand why people do it. I understand why people like it. Fishing, hunting, all of these things are great pastimes. They're outdoor pastimes. This is that, that very much that rugged individualism that defined America for so long is held on to the south held on in the South. You know, Daniel Boone was a Southerner. Davy Crockett was a Southerner. Daniel Boone was the quintessential American. And so when you look at this piece that John Devaney wrote about Maxie Gregg's uh, hunting uh, journal, um, it's, and it's titled Real Southern Sport. Uh, it's Maxie Gregg's Sporting Journals, I'm sorry, 1842 to 1858, published by Green Altar Books, which is uh, Shotwell P- Press. It's their other division, one of their other divisions. Uh, it's not just a story of hunting. Um, Maxie Gregg, of course, is not politically correct because he was a Confederate general. Of course, died at the Battle of Fredericksburg. But as Devaney points out, he says, Gregg's journals illustrate how close he is to his country kin and worldview and culture and how dominant agrarian values and culture among city dwellers in the South. Greg complains of his urban confinement, the rascally 
and the tedious lawyer trade that he pursues. Every reasonable opportunity is taken by Maxie Gregg to go afield. As Dr. Kibler notes in his foreword, and of course Jim Kibler is one of our scholars, Gregg's journals are rich sources of the customs, topography, or ornithology, climate, flora, and fauna of the Carolinas, Georgia, and Mexico. Gregg's grandfather, Jonathan Maxey, was the first president of the state Carolina College, which is now University of South Carolina. Maxey Gregg was a student of the first rank when he attended South Carolina College. He also did not receive his diploma, protesting a coin toss in his favor that resulted in his being named the top student in his class. Greg thought the faculty needed to make the hard choice between himself and his academic rival. He wanted no academic prizes gained by the whims of Madden Fortune. This incident reveal, uh, revealed in Greg both high principle and a certain intransigence, traits one expects in a future fire eater. Greg's academic credentials shine through in his journals and the meticulous descriptions of weather, location as determined by latitude and longitude, his facility with the Latin names of birds, and his astronomical observations of rare aurora borealis over the city of Columbia. So this is a well-educated man who's writing about not just hunting and sporting, but about southern life and all the things that made an agrarian man um, and I think that's important again this is the flower of southern culture as Devaney says contrary to popular views of many the southern elite rarely had the time or inclination to sip mint, sip mint juleps on the porch when time did present itself Greg preferred to spend it afield Um, so, uh, as, as Devaney says, the Maxi Gregg's journal is a, is a sporting journal and to the modern sportsman or conservationist, it can be jarring to read. I've hunted, cleaned and cooked waterfowl and upland birds for many years. So there is little about life in the field that would give me pause. What does arrest one about Gregg's journal is that most of his kills are birds. Contemporary hunters no longer classify as game birds. Robins, herons, goldfinches, larks, sparrows, swallows, and water birds of all varieties are all fair game. Greg and his hunting partners have no qualms about shooting large animals for what some contemporary bird hunters refer large numbers of what some contemporary bird hunters refer to as tweety birds. True, Greg's interest in ornithology provides a motive for some of the specimens he shoots, but the sheer numbers of taken on some of his hunts go well beyond what would be necessary for specimen collection. If contemporary ideas concerning conservation are all but absent in Greg's day, hunter safety was a casual affair for Greg and his companions. On two occasions, Greg records firing into bushes at game that he thought was sheltering there, but which he could not see. He did not seem too concerned with what might be downrange from the bushes. It was also amusing of amusing to read of Greg's firing buckshot and number four shot at diminutive bird songbirds, giving new meaning for, for the term overkill. So, I mean, it's an interesting look at Southern society, but it also provides, as I said, a look at, and as John Devaney says, Dr. Devaney, as a look at uh, Southern life and society and culture and the, the world in which they lived, not just the people, but also the place and the time, it's a positive view of these things in many ways. It's an agrarian view of the world. And so we have that part of Southern culture that's worthy of preservation, Southern tradition that's worthy of discussion. But then we have one of the most beautiful parts of Southern life, which is music. And we have three pieces this particular week about music. I want to start with the last piece first. It's the piece on not just Whistling Dixie by Jack, uh, John Marcourt, Jack Marcourt, who's one of our resident scholars in Japan. We have two there now, interestingly enough. And uh, Jack wrote this piece about singing Billy Walker. Now, a couple of years ago when we did our summer school on music, uh, singing Billy Walker was one of the topics. Uh, Jim Kibler, again, did a nice discussion of singing Billy Walker. 
And what most people don't realize about modern Christian music is that Billy Walker and his brother-in-law, Benjamin Franklin White, wrote the hymnals that just about every Protestant and even some Catholic churches use on a, on a weekly basis in their services. They wrote the tunes. They didn't write all the lyrics. They wrote the tunes, though. They wrote the melody to these lyrics. So, for example, the best example we have of this is, of course, the very famous song, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace is a mess of a song written by, the lyrics are written by John Newton, but he didn't write a melody. He wrote, he wrote the lyrics. And so up until singing Billy Walker, you had various versions of Amazing Grace all over the place. Europe, the United States, people had different melodies, and some of them are a little bit strange. They would definitely be strange to us now because we all know the tune. Singing Billy Walker comes along, and he writes the tune, and it becomes the accepted melody across the world, not just in the South, because, of course, Singing Billy Walker is from South Carolina. Benjamin Franklin White is also from South Carolina, but then eventually moved to Georgia. Not just the South, but all over the world. And what most people don't realize is when they sing that tune, they're singing a Confederate song, because Singing Billy Walker was an ardent Confederate. His Southern Harmony and Musical Companion was the hymnal for many Protestant churches in the South and then also in the North. Benjamin Franklin White's Sacred Harp hymnal was widely used north and south. And uh, where I live, there's a little town north of here called Whitesville. It's in Georgia. And uh, it was founded by Benjamin Franklin White. He moved his congregation here. He had a falling out with Billy Walker. They, they were, uh, bro again, uh, brothers through marriage. And they didn't necessarily get along all the time. But... They were both responsible for this growth in Christian music in the South. And, of course, that growth would then transfer out to other parts of the United States and people sing essentially Confederate songs every Sunday. If they knew that, there would probably be some effort to ban Amazing Grace or they'd go back to some version of it before singing Billy Walker got a hold of it because that's a racist song now, even though the entire song is written for absolution for slave trading. And, of course, everyone knew that. But uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful tune, and the way that it's sung, of course, is a beautiful melody, and it's written by Singing Billy Walker. And I think Jack does a great job bringing out who Singing Billy Walker was. And we've got a lecture on it. If you just go to our webpage, abbeyvalinstitute.org, and click and uh, look up uh, Singing Billy Walker, it will come up with that lecture by Jim Kibler from a couple of years ago at our summer schools, 2018 summer school. Um, on Southern music. Great, great conference, by the way. But uh, this piece is indicative of what the Southern tradition offers to modern America. You see, what does the Southern tradition bring to us today? It's not just it's not just to talk about, well, this is the way they did it in 1842, 1843. Now, what does this say about people and what can it bring to Americans today that would give them something of value to help them live better lives? And one of the things, of course, is conservation. One of the things is agrarianism. One of the things is music and literature and film. And so if you look at the piece that we ran on Monday, it's by Ben Jones, who, of course, was Cooter on the Dukes of Hazzard, wrote this for the website and said, hey, I've got this little short story I want to give to you. Would you run it? <clears throat> Might be interested in it. And I said, sure. It's a little fictional piece about a neighbor that he has from the north who thinks that everything good is from the north. And he's got this other neighbor who chose him a lesson about real Southern music. And basically, he says, everything that's good about music came from the South. And he's right about that. Again, an entire conference we did is dedicated to that position that all music, I think there was you know polka or something else that Tom Daniels said, wasn't. But basically, all American music comes out of the South. And so... Uh, this is a funny piece because uh, the uh, the neighbor, uh, this Yankee neighbor of his, uh, can't get over the fact that he was shown up by this Southerner who brings out his banjo and he plays all these tunes. It's really good the way that uh, that uh, Jones puts all this together. 
and uh, the, the story that he tells. And it's funny. It's funny. He told me uh, in the email, he said, well, I, I ran this by my wife and, uh, and Daisy Duke who's staying with us, and she liked it too. So um, this is approved by Daisy Duke. Uh, and I think that if anybody reads it, it's it's not something, again, It's we run literature at times, and it, we run little stories, and it's about music. It's not something we always do, and I know people like it when we do the political stuff, and that's okay. But we got to remember what the beautiful thing about the South is, and music is that, and literature, telling a good story. Who are the best storytellers in America? Southerners. Why? Because they know the dramatic pauses. They know how to do the right things. They know where to put the right inflection. They know how to grab people, and I think Ben Jones is an excellent storyteller. He's been doing it his whole life. And that story is no different. And then I wrote a piece on Wednesday entitled The Steel Woods. It's about the band The Steel Woods. It's a new band, uh, the lead singer, and I, I'm not sure where the guitar player is from. I think he's also from Alabama, but I, I could be mistaken about that. But certainly the singer is excellent vocalist from Randolph County, Alabama, which is uh, just near Birmingham. But uh, they're a, a band that plays you know, country, southern rock, and they're a gritty type of band. Now, there's a renaissance in this stuff, this kind of outlaw country, southern rock. We had one in the 1970s, kind of went underground a little bit, and, um, but again, it's coming back. you got this, uh, people are reacting to Nashville country and the very polished stuff. And so um, this uh, Steel Woods band is certainly in that in that vein of, of bands that are reacting to the uh, what's often called bro country, right? Um, but they play a Merle Haggard tune. They cover that, and they cover, uh, of course, Tom Petty's Southern accents, and they which I didn't initially note as Tom Petty, but uh, it, it it is. Um, they cover uh, they cover a Black Sabbath tune, uh, which is interesting. They cover the Allman Brothers, but they also do. Great new stuff. And, of course, their most famous tune is a, is a tune entitled Straw in the Wind, which is, I think, in many ways like uh, a Marshall Tucker tune. Uh, they've got a song that sounds a lot like Skinner. Uh, what the Skinner song would be Double Trouble. Um, but the lyrics, I mean, would go along with, say, Flannery O'Connor or William Faulkner and this very gritty kind of look at the South and working class I mean, I, I put some lyrics in there from Hank Williams Jr., The American Way. This is what you get out of this. It's working class Southern music. It's real. It's, uh, it's dangerous. It's, uh, it's uh, again, gritty. It's dark at times. Um, and you have a lot of groups that are doing this stuff now. And people are gravitating to it because it has character. You see... Modern country music and modern pop music and all they don't have any character. You you know these people aren't telling real stories. They're just kind of putting some lyrics together and it all sounds good. And you got to have a dirt road and a pickup truck and uh, you know a, a a pretty girl in the seat next to you or whatever the case may be. Uh, and but it's it's not real. When you listen to this stuff, you know these people come. You know, Tyler Childress, which is uh, Appalachia, and it is greedy, uh, dark real stuff. I mean, he's singing from personal experience of these things, or at least people in his community. And that's what makes it so good. That's what made the outlaw country stuff from the 1960s into the 70s so good. You know, it was real. It wasn't just, uh, you know, baby be my love song, uh, which I mean, look, all of that pop country is written for uh, Midwestern housewives. And so, I mean, this stuff is not written for that. It's written for a much different type of audience, but it's such good stuff. And again, it's a real reflection of Southern culture. Southerners produce great music. Music is part of the character and the fabric of the Southern tradition. It's what helps make the Southern tradition so great. So it's why when uh, we, we have an opportunity to talk about music, we do it. Now, of course, you can get that other places too. Southern Living talks about music sometimes, I believe, and you've got all kinds of music journals out there, but they don't do it in a way that shows that, I mean, this is the, uh, the defiance that is so important in Southern life. Because what they're complaining about in their tunes, the Steel Woods and, and some of the ta songs they do, they, again, they get a little mixed up because they bring up, you know, Liberty Bell and Statue of Liberty and okay, and the U.S. flag, 
What they're really protesting is Hamilton's America. They're protesting the centralization of everything in America and the loss of regional identity, which is exactly what those other things represent. So this is the problem with the Republican Party in the South. And I mean, it's something we've talked about before and how they they make Southerners believe that their regional identity is not as important as bad. Uh, that the Hamiltonian vision of America is better. It's not. It's not. And so I, I think that this stuff is very Jeffersonian. It's gritty. It's roots. It's grassroots. I mean, it's, it's what's important about Southern life and Southern society. And it's not middle class. It's working class. It's blue collar stuff. And so that appeals to a, to a broad swath of Southerners who really still view themselves, even if they're in white-collar jobs, as working-class, blue-collar people. I mean, it's real farming and uh, agrarian. I mean, this is what you're getting out of it. And poverty and hard times, it's what it's, it's blues. And it's what the South, it's what Southern music really is famous for across the spectrum, whether it's blues music, country music, jazz music, rock and roll. I mean, you take it's, it's blues. It's all got that bluesy feel to it. It's why everyone in Europe wanted to do it at one point. And when they came over to the United States, that's what they first played. They played all that different kind of music. And it's why it doesn't matter about your race. Everyone played. I mean, Ray Charles wanted to be a country musician because country blues didn't matter. It's all the same stuff. It's different, little different sound to it. So, it's a, it's a wonderful band, the Steel Woods. Go out there and listen to it. Last piece of the week is the second part of Clyde Wilson's installation on installment, or second installment, I should say, his series on uh, Southern films that are tolerable for Southerners or at least good to watch if you're a Southerner. And we'll have part three next week. Um, this particular piece gets into the colonial revolutionary South. And he talks about some, some films that are good. One is the new world, which uh, came out in 2005 about the, um, uh, the Jamestown settlement. And one thing I'll say about that is that again, the Republicans, particularly in the North want to make it a point that new world, the Jamestown is bad. Pilgrims are good. That's, that's what we need to understand. Pilgrims are good. Virginians are bad, right? Because, the South has to be the bad. Um, the Howards of Virginia, he recommends. The Patriot, which, um, funny story, uh, when that film was being made in 2000, I was in South Carolina, and my roommate at the time, uh, it was in, being made in, I guess, 1999. My roommate at the time um, came back one weekend. He was up where they were filming. And he said, yeah, they were doing a casting call for, uh, for extras. And uh, I, I just didn't, we, we didn't really, it's for cell phones, of course. And I didn't recall you anything. This was our chance to be in a film with Mel Gibson and uh, make our names for ourselves and just, uh, you know, be big actors. But it uh, didn't work out. But uh, The Patriot is a very good film. The Great Meadow, 1931. Um, Antebellum South, he mentions Jezebel and um, the Santa Fe Trail, which we were able to find a, a link to uh, the entire film for that. September Dawn. Um, uh, the Alamo, uh, the 2004 version of the Alamo, he says is very good. Gone to Texas, 1986. Um, of course, he'll get into the war itself at some point. And he, he does a, he, next week we're going to be talking about Amistad, but he's going to have an entire section dedicated to the war. But of course, Gone with the Wind is part of this. Um, I think that what you've seen recently is that uh, anytime we have the antebellum South, it has to be portrayed as a backwoods, backwards place that uh, is just full of evil Nazis. I mean, essentially, that's what they were saying. Of course, that's not true. Um, the the Maxi Gregg Journal show you these people weren't stupid. Uh, they were very intelligent people. And uh, to portray them that way is completely distort the actual historical record. Um, and I think that's, that's often what happens with these things and why you should be very careful about what you get out of Hollywood about life in the South or uh, Southern history. Um, the 2004 version of the Alamo, I really love, and I show it when I have a film class. I show it all the time uh, because I think it's a really good film. Some There are some issues with it at times, but it's a really good film. 
Um, and it, it does a very nice job of accurately portraying uh, the, the uh, Battle of the Alamo and, of course, the, uh, the lead-up to the Battle of the Alamo. One thing it does not do, I mean, it kind of shows a massacre at Goliad, but um, it does a great job with the Battle of San Jacinto. I mean, it's, it's a good film. It's not just about the siege of the Alamo. It gets into everything leading up to that Texan independence and, of course, the aftermath of the Alamo. So I really like it. It's got some good Southern actors in it. Billy Bob Thornton is one. Um, so um, I definitely recommend that you read these these installments in this series by Clyde Wilson and go out and get these films. Uh, some of them, again, are available. We put a couple of links up there for YouTube videos. The General, which the, the silent film The General, it's just absolutely hilarious. If you're looking for a film to watch with children, it's a great one. I mean, there's no, I mean, there's the violence is slapstick, like uh, you know Wiley e. Coyote and the and the Road Runner. I mean, it's uh, you know it's funny stuff, and um, it's uh, it's uh, it, the Confederacy wins, and they're the good guys at the end of the day, which is great. So um, it's a wonderful film. We've got a lot of different uh, selections there, and. So, again, Clyde would recommend certain films and not others, and he tells you which ones are terrible to avoid. And he mentions uh, several films in the piece that are also we don't need to watch because they're just so bad. Um, so, all that said, these are the beautiful things about the Southern tradition that we need to hang on to and uh, that we should hang on to and what we should champion and be a very positive message for the South moving forward because that's how you're going to persuade people that the South, the Southern tradition is worthy of respect admiration, and emulation in many ways. Until next time, good day. Good day.